Hi, welcome to our third Advanced Higher Physics Hangout. And we're making this a regular Tuesday evening slot at 7 o'clock. I'll be on this air for the next half hour and I'll be over some of the questions which appear quite often in the Advanced Higher Physics. It's a good half hour to give you a wee bit of the work. Now, I'm having problems with the broadband and it's freezing. So if you see the screen freezing, uh, then it will just, in fact, listen to me and you can catch up a bit later on. In fact, I think it's freezing right now. So I'm going to go straight to screen share and see if we can pick it up from there. So we should be on screen share. Uh, I hope you are actually uh, following this through with a wee bit of technical problems here. I don't know what's happening with the broadband. But I hope we can see through because we're now into another Mr. Miles hangout, uh, something which we've, we'll be looking, for, we'll, we'll be working on for the next half hour. So there we go, man. It's another Mr. Miles advanced physics hangout. Can't wait to watch. I just hope you're not waiting with that screen freezing. So here's keeping my fingers crossed. So let's start with our first problem for tonight. And our first problem for tonight is this one here. It's an inductor circuit. You have an inductor, you have a resistor, and you have a switch, and you have a voltage supply. And the first question is asking us then, explain what is meant by an inductance of two Henrys. Now that's a standard thing you have to learn, and the standard answer is this one here. An inductance of two Henrys is there'll be a back EMF of two volts, and that will be induced in the coil when the rate of change of current in the coil equals one amp per second. And that's the standard definition of it. So when I switch a switch on and the current starts to change, there'll be a back EMF, which will be opposing the battery, and that will act in that particular direction there. So learn this statement here. What's an inductance of two Henry's? It's a back EMF of two volts, which will be induced in the coil when the rate of change of current in the coil equals one amp per second. Now the second part of this question is calculate the rate of change of current when the switch is initially closed. Now when the switch up here is closed, no current flows, which means the back EMF must be opposing the voltage of the supply. So it must be 12 volts. So we know a little equation the back EMF E is going to equal to minus the inductance L times the rate of change of current, dI by dt. So what we have to do is plug in the numbers. Uh, we have the back EMF at the start of the circuit must be equal to minus 12 volts because it's going opposite the supply. And that equals, uh, in this case, minus L. We know the inductance is 2 Henry, so it's going to be 2 multiplied by di by dt. And we can't forget that minus sign there as well. Two minus signs cancel, and if we rearrange, we have di by dt is equal to minus 12 divided by minus 2, and the answer is going to be 6. What's the units of the rate of change of current? 6 amps. Per second. So it's a nice little question to start off tonight. Uh, we now know our definition of the inductance, what inductance means, and we can work it out uh, an equation for the back EMF, which is this equation here, back EMF E equals the inductor minus the value of the inductor times the rate of change of current. So that's us got an answer for that one then. And we know also at the beginning of the circuit, when the switch is closed over, the current flow in the circuit will be zero because the back EMF is such that it's going to oppose the 12 volts. So that's the first question done for tonight. Let's see what other question awaits us in this advanced higher hangout. It's the velocity selector. Now what on earth is a velocity selector? It does exactly what it says on the tin. It selects a particular velocity. And the definition for a velocity selector is that a charged particle entering into a velocity sector region, this little charged particle here, will be in the presence of a combined electric and magnetic field. 
if I just move out the electric field, there's the magnetic field, and that's the electric field. So the two fields are crossed. Now, we know fine well that when the, uh, if we have the electron moving into an electric field, it will be pulled up towards the plate like that. It will experience a force upwards. So what's the force experienced by this charged particle, this, this uh, charged particle here, which we'll call Q, and we assume that it's negative charged, then the charged particle will experience a force uh, electrostatically, and that force will be equal to Q times E, E being the electric field. Now we can adapt that a wee bit because we know the electric field is uniform, and if we know that the potential difference between the two plates is potential difference V, and we also know the distance between the two plates is a distance D, then we can change the force to become the electric force is equal to Q V divided by D. So that's the force experienced upwards by the electro, the charged particle, the negative charged particle. Now it's also the presence of a magnetic field, and the magnetic field will exert a force on the charged particle. And that force is given by this equation here. F equals QVB sine theta. In this case, the velocity of the charged particle and the magnetic field, which is pointing into your screen, are both at right angles. So the resulting force will have to be both at right angles today. And this is where we use the famous right hand rule. Now I can't show you a right hand rule live, but if you point your first finger into the screen and your second finger to the right of the screen, the direction of the charged particle, your thumb should be pointing downwards. And this will be a downwards force. So if we have a charged particle like that, we know the force is acting on it. And we can arrange the following. We can arrange for the two forces to, to balance out. And the two forces balance out, the little charged particle will neither move up nor down, it will just simply go straight across. And if we arrange for a gap for the particle to come out, that particle will leave out that direction. So what's the expression for uh, these balanced forces? Well, the upward force we know is going to be equal to, um, in this case, we don't really need the second part, we can just say the upward force is going to be Q times the electric field. And the downward force is going to be QVB since it's at right angles, V, B, uh, sine theta is going to be equal to 90 degrees, which is going to be 1. So we only have Q, V, B. So if these two forces are balanced then, we simply have Q, E is equal to Q, V, B. Remember that's the velocity, not the potential difference. The two Qs cancel from each side, and we can get an expression for the velocity. The velocity of that particle should be equal to uh, the ratio of E divided by B. Now that's a fantastic little equation because we now know that any of these charged particles moving in a straight line in this particular field, these two fields here, will have a velocity equal to the ratio of the electric field and the magnetic field. So we can arrange both to be uh, equal to a certain velocity. So, if we satisfy the condition of E divided by B, this little particle will then travel in a straight line and leave through this gap. And when it leaves this gap, we know definitely that its velocity is equal to E divided by B. So we have selected a velocity. And that's a very important thing to do in things like a mass spectrometer, where we have to select a particular velocity. Now, if the velocity, uh, if we have a different value uh, of the speed, if the speed becomes uh, small, if we have a, a small speed, then the magnetic force is going to be smaller than the electric force. So the electric force will pull us up. So small speeds will be pulled up here like that because the magnetic force is smaller than the electric force. And likewise, Big speeds, we'll have uh, a big speed, we'll have the magnetic force bigger than the electric force. So we'll have, uh, oh, sorry, I've changed, the, <laughs> I've changed the particle, uh, get back to its normal shape, there it is there. 
the if we have a, a bigger speed, it's the magnetic force that's bigger, and the particle will arrive and hit that barrier there. So only those particles with speed e divided by b will pass through the gap, and we'll have what we call a velocity selector. Good question to learn, and could appear in this year's advanced higher. Let's look at the next question. And we're still on the idea of a magnetic field. And we have a charged particle moving in a magnetic field. And that charged particle will be subjected to a force. And the force will be once again given by the expression force acting on the charged particle Q is equal to its charge Q times its speed V times the magnetic field induction strength B times sine of theta. But since the particle is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, then sine theta becomes one, and we have the force acting on the particle is QVB. Now, what direction will the particle experience the force? Well, you do your right-hand rule again. The magnetic field is into the page. The velocity is going up the way. So if you put your first finger into your screen and your second finger heading up the screen, you see your thumb is pointing to the right of the screen. So your thumb is pointing in this particular direction. And that's the force which this particle will experience. It'll experience a force at right angles to the velocity in that particular direction uh, there. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means this particle is going to start to experience a turning force and will appear in a circular motion. So the particle, in fact, moves in a circular motion like that. Just make that little arrow a little bit smaller. Now, if the particle goes further up, we know that the particle must always have a velocity which is at a tangent to the circle, we can see there, and the force QVB must always be perpendicular to the velocity and the B field. So we're going to have the force pointing in the way like that. So you can see what we're going to have here. We're having a uh, circular motion. So the particle, the charged particle moving into the magnetic field will experience a circular path of that circular motion. Now, one of the famous questions I can ask you is, is find an expression for the radius of that circular motion. Now, we know that the force which uh, the charged particle undergoes is QVB, and that will be the force which is really the centripetal force, which is causing the particle to be dragged into a circle. So we just need to equate both of them. We can say that the magnetic force, uh, FB, is responsible for the centripetal force FC. So Q V B is equal to M V squared upon R. How many times have we used that expression? So we rearrange for R, we can go up here and rearrange for R, cross multiply Q V B R is going to equal to M V squared. 1V cancels from both sides, and we're left with QBR is going to equal to MV. So we've now got an expression for the radius. Radius R is going to equal to MV divided by QB. Now that's a very important little equation for particles moving in an, a, a magnetic field because we know the radius of the particle is given by mv divided by qb. Now, the picture you see on your left is, is perhaps a really beautiful picture, and it's a picture uh, showing you the creation of an electron and a positron from some particle moving in here. There's a moment of creation there. Now, just looking at this picture, which was taken in a cloud chamber, a cloud chamber, remember, the magnetic field is either into this page or out of the page. The cloud chamber forms little tracks of condensation, just the same way as an aircraft uh, makes tracks in the sky. Uh, what happens is that we can see the tracks made by the charged particles. 
Now, what we can say from this diagram with surety, because we don't know it's an electron or positron, we can say that the radius uh, is getting smaller for each one of them, so we're losing momentum. And that's due to maybe other little collisions or just, just simply going through the material. So this one's losing energy as the radius becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, and so is that one. This one starts with a bigger radius, which must mean it must have had a bigger share of MV. Bigger MV, bigger radius, which must mean, must mean it had a bigger share of momentum. And the very fact that this part was going in that direction, and this part was going in that direction, tells you that both have got, in fact, opposite charge. So if I wanted to sort of, kind of write a kind of story about that from this picture, I would just say that all I can say from that picture is that the two particles created here have got opposite charge. And the other piece of information I can get from opposite charge is I can get that the radius of them is decreasing, which means that their uh, energy is decreasing, energy decreasing. And I also can tell from it that this particle here had the most momentum when it was created. So that's a really good picture to study. Uh, it's, a, it's an iconic picture of a bubble chamber of the creation of a electron on, and a proton. I'll let you find out which one is which by doing a little search on the internet. And you also can figure out what's happening here as two particles come in here and uh, disappear or one that you can think of it going this way. Something's coming this way which has got no charge. So it's not making a track. And then it creates two particles going this way which have got these opposite charges because there's a big radius going this way and a big radius going that way. But I'll leave you to figure out what that one is as well. It's a wee bit of internet research. But our main answer to this question is that the radius of a charged particle in a magnetic field is given by its momentum, mv, divided by qb. And that, once again, is linked to the mass spectrometer question, which we did in the last question, which was the velocity selector. Now let's look at our third question for this evening. And it's the closest approach. What we got here, we have the closest approach. And it is, we're asked to find how close will that alpha particle get to that large gold nucleus before it stops? How, how, how far will it get there? Now this problem is very, very similar to Bart Simpson here using his skateboard to climb up this hill because Bart will have a certain velocity as he moves towards that slope. And if he has a certain velocity, he's going to have a certain kinetic energy. Ek equals a half mv squared. Now, provided there's no friction on this track, Bart's kinetic energy is going to take him up to a certain height. So it might take him up to that height there. Because that's the kinetic energy which takes him up to that height. All the kinetic energy then is changed into potential energy. And the potential energy is equal to mgh. So this little simple linear uh, kinematics example is really the same as what we're talking about here with the gold nucleus and the alpha particle. The alpha particle are way out here in infinity, travelling at speed v, will approach this here and its kinetic energy will be slowly changed into potential energy. It will get to such a point that all its kinetic energy will be changed into potential energy at a particular point. So say it reaches that particular distance here, which we'll call r. So all its kinetic energy here, the kinetic energy of the proton, which we can find by the same way as Bart's method, Ek is a half mv squared, will be changed into potential energy here. Now, what is expression for the potential energy at a distance r from the centre of a, a, a charged particle, in this case the gold nucleus? Well, the potential is given that expression there. Q divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r, and that's the potential at that, that, that point here. So the potential, if you reach that point here, that's the potential it has. Now, what will be its potential energy? Well, the potential energy, Ep, is simply found by equaling the work 
which is done by getting the charged particle here in the first place. The potential is equal to the work done. Uh, you've done work to move that electron, is to move this alpha particle from infinity to here. And that work done we know is equal to the size of its charge, Q, times the potential difference it went, uh, it went through. Now we know the potential at that point is Q with 4 pi epsilon r, and we know that this has got a charge Q, then the potential energy is going to be simply Q times V, which is simply going to be Q, big Q, over 4 pi epsilon on R. So I now know where all my kinetic energy has been, in fact, changed into. So we can just simply do the same thing as Bart Simpson did here, and we can say the kinetic energy of the alpha particle, Ek, which was equal to one half mv squared, and we can work that out because we know the mass of the alpha particle is six point seven times ten to the minus twenty seven times its speed squared, and its speed is six times ten to the power five. And it's nowhere near relativistic speed, so we can afford to do that and work out the kinetic energy this alpha particle had when it was a way out and it was approaching the nucleus. So we do that calculation, we end up with a value of 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15 joules. So that's the kinetic energy of the particle. Now all that kinetic energy will be changed into the potential energy at that point. So we have the potential energy formula, which we know for the that particular point in space, the potential energy is going to equal to small q, large q, over 4 pi, epsilon naught r. Now that equals what's the charge on the charge on the alpha particle, it's made up of two protons, so it's going to be 2 times 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And the charge on the gold nucleus is 79 protons. So it's going to be 79, lots of 1.69. So there's the two charges here, multiplied out. And the one of the four pi epsilon naught, we can change that to time nine times 10 to the power nine. And then we can divide that by uh, R. So we can work out a potential energy at that point. And the potential energy, we do the calculation, we end up with something like uh, three point, uh, work out the potential energy, I'll do, do that quite quickly now. Potential energy is going to equal to uh, 3.6, 3.6 times 10 to the minus 26 divided by R, okay. And that must be equal to our kinetic energy, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15. So we rearrange, therefore we can find out what R is. R is going to equal to 3.6 times 10 to the minus 26 divided by 1.2 times 10 to the minus 15. So we do that calculation, we get R, and R hopefully comes out to be roughly 3.0 times 10 to the minus 11 meters. So that's the distance of the closest approach of that alpha particle. And after that, it moves away as the, alpha, as the big gold nucleus repulses it. So that's a good question to study. It's a very good one, because it will come up one way or the other. You've got to know the following things. You've got to know how to work out the potential at a point. That's just the potential. The potential energy at a point is the same as the work done, which is QV, which is Q, Q with 4 pi epsilon naught R. We know the kinetic energy of the alpha particles. So we can work that out. And that kinetic energy is going to be exactly equal to Q, Q dash with 4 pi epsilon naught R. And we equate the two and we can get a final answer.
good question to do and one to study even if you go back to YouTube uh, YouTube video which I hope is working I hope I've not been stuck in one picture all the time uh, we can work that out and you can play it back again nearly finished here is our final question for tonight and our final question for tonight is one which we haven't done for a while and it is simple harmonic motion now we better know simple harmonic motion because we don't know simple harmonic motion uh, this guy to deal with there is uh, you better know this or else for something to exhibit simple harmonic motion the acceleration is proportional to the displacement and in the opposite direction to the displacement that's why we put a minus sign in here so we can find an expression of for y in terms of acceleration we can look things up and we can find our answer now what we got here then we have a test tube which is floating in water and it's moved slightly from its equilibrium and you know what's going to happen it's going to oscillate in the liquid like that until it comes to a stop again now the displacement of the test tube about its equilibrium position is given by the expression y equals at 0 0.05 cos of 6t now what we've got to do is we have to work out uh, the velocity and acceleration from that and then get our answer so what we're looking for here and the final question is this determine whether the motion of the test tube is simple harmonic motion and when we do that find the frequency of the test tube's motion right Alex Ferguson's telling us over the corner here that the acceleration equals minus omega squared y. So all we've got to do is find the derivative of y because we know that uh, the speed v of the particle is equal to dy by dt. So if we do a calculation here, we get uh, the derivative of 0 0.05. That stays the same. The derivative of cos is minus, so it's going to be minus, and we have to multiply it by the 6, and then we have the sine 6t, sine uh, 6t here. So the speed of the particle is going to be equal to minus 0 0.05 uh, times 6 sine 6t. Now I'm not going to multiply this out because you'll see what happens in, in a minute. Now we've got the expression for the velocity, now we want to find an expression for the acceleration and we should know this by now, acceleration is dv by dt, so we take the derivative of this character here. So we're going to have the same number at the front, minus 0 0.05, just move Alec out of the way, minus 0 0.05 times 6 and then you have to multiply by 6 again, because there's a 6t in there. And then the sine 6t, the sine 6t becomes the cos 6t. So if I do that, I'm left with minus 0 0.05 times 36 times cos 6t. Now look very carefully, can you see that y is 0 0.05 and cos 6t, cos 6t. So really what I've got here is I've got the acceleration is going to equal to minus 36 times y because 0 0.05 times cos 6t is equal to y. So there I've got an expression for acceleration. Now we bring out Alec again. Alec Ferguson has. There's Alec there. He's telling us you better miss it else. The acceleration right underneath this acceleration equals uh, minus omega squared y. So we have proved that the acceleration is proportional to the y displacement and also in the opposite direction. So that is simple harmonic motion. So we say it's SHM, simple harmonic motion. Now, if you're asked to find the frequency of the, the test tube as it bobs up and down, then you just have to compare omega squared with 36. So omega squared 
is equal to 36. So omega equals 6. And we know that omega equals 2 pi f. So 2 pi f equals 36. So therefore, the frequency of that test, you bobs up and down, is 36 divided by 2 pi, which equals 18 over pi hertz. So that's a good question. We haven't done that for a while. We haven't looked at the acceleration for simple harmonic motion. And we end this hangout with that little question. I do hope that the that it's not froze tonight. If it has, I do apologise. It's something that just happened in the last couple of nights. Uh, and I hope maybe it's worked. The, the hangout has continued on. I'll go back in a minute. Before we do so, we end this hangout. And we have to end with this gentleman here. Captain Kirk have found Mr. Mal's advance hair hangout. And this is in honour of Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock, who gave me a great love and desire to learn about physics. Leonard Nimoy. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, hangout. Uh, it's been good fun doing it. If I can back onto the main screen again. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the hangout tonight. I'm still freezing. I don't know what the problem is. It's not cold. It's just maybe the bandwidth. I hope you can hear my sound on here anyway. And I uh, hope we'll see you again next week at the same time. Well, not be frozen solid. Mr. Mallon's Hangouts, number three. See you next week.